All right, y'all, let's learn how to write a long essay question or an LEQ. And depending on your persuasion, this might be the most difficult essay you have to write on your AP exam because look at it just sitting there judging you. You don't know anything about this topic, do you, you doink? There are no documents, no help. You just have to crack open those brain folds and start writing. So how do you do that? How do you get a perfect score on an LEQ? Well, I'm about to tell you. So if you're ready to get that brain cows milked, Let's get to it. Before we jump into it, you should know that everything I'm about to say about the LEQ applies without modification to the AP World, A Push, and AP Euro essays. They're all graded on the same rubric, they all require the same skills, so I'm gonna give you some examples for each. And let me just quickly mention that this video is just one part of my AP essay cram course, which actually goes into a much greater depth on how to write DBQs, LEQs, and SAQs for AP World, AP US, and AP Euro. It's got examples for every point on the rubrics that'll show you what earns the point and what doesn't, plus there's videos from this guy that you won't find here on YouTube. So if you're struggling with these essays, that might be the thing to help you, link in the description below. So the LEQ is the last thing you're gonna have to do on your exam, and you're gonna have 40 minutes to write it. You will have already passed through the multiple choice, the short answer questions, the DBQ, and if at that point you have any shred of life and human dignity remaining in your soul, then you know maybe you have what it takes to earn a perfect score on this essay, which would be a six. Before I get to the steps in writing, you should know that the College Board tells you ahead of time from which periods they're going to be pulling these questions. It's not a mystery, it's right there in their course and exam descriptions, and here it is in a satisfying little chart. You can see they're gonna give you three options and you only have to write one. So make sure that you choose the one that you know the most about. Okay, now let's get to the steps for writing this essay. Step one, read the prompt. Now just like on the DBQ, your first task is to read the prompt. And when I say read, I mean really read it. Understand what it is asking, mark it up. And I emphasize this because as I never tire of reminding you, when you're under pressure, you are dumber than you think. And that is not an insult, that is just a fact of the universe. So take a minute and really read read it. And when you do, you're going to be looking for three things, all of which you need to mark on the paper. And don't be the guy who's like, yeah, I can remember it. No, no, you can't. Write it down. Now, the first thing you need to mark on the prompt is the time period they give you. Remember, if you write the most brilliant essay that has ever been written in the history of history writing, but you're talking about the wrong time period, no points for you. And trust me, as someone who has scored these essays for the national exam, one of the most frequent mistakes students make is to write outside the time period that is given. But not you, my dear pupil, not you. You're going to mark that thing up. You're going to underline that time period. And if they they give you a time period in centuries, you're gonna write out those numbers. Remember, under pressure, your IQ declines precipitously, and so when you see the 20th century, write out the 1900s just so you don't get confused. The second thing you wanna mark is the historical thinking skill they want you to write with. So notice here they explicitly mention causation. That means your essay needs to be a causation essay, and if it's not, it's going to be hard to earn full points. And sometimes the AP overlords like to confuse you. For example, look at these prompts from the 2022 A-Push exam. In all of them, they want you to evaluate the relative importance of causes of different Events. So although you will be talking about causes, it's really a comparison essay. You're comparing the different causes and making an argument for which one of them is most important. So mark the historical thinking skill because that's the skill that needs to frame your essay. Third, you need to mark the categories they give you to write about. This one wants you to compare the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1848. This one wants you to compare economic developments of different parts of Europe. So don't write an essay comparing social or political developments. And the way you save yourself from such an egregious mistake is by marking up the prompt. All right, step two, get a six or maybe a five. Okay, now that you've understood the prompt and what they're asking you to write about, you need to understand the rubric and the points that you can earn. As I said, there's a total of six points you can earn, but I'm going to encourage you to only aim for five, and I'm going to explain that later. The first point you can earn is for the thesis, and you can get up to one point for this. Now, in order to get that juicy thesis point, your thesis has to do two things. First, it must be historically defensible. That just means that your thesis must make an argument, like it has to take a stand. So for the first A-Push prompt for 2022, you have to take a stand. Among the causes of migration during that period were religious freedom and economic opportunity. For example. So you can't just say two causes for population movement were religious freedom and economic opportunity. That is an argument, but it's not the kind of argument they're asking you to make. You have to choose which one is more important and then go with that. The second thing your thesis needs to do is establish a line of reasoning. That means you have to show how you're going to defend your argument, and for this, stuff some vocabulary in there. You can't just say there were many significant similarities between the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1848. I mean, yeah, technically that's barely an argument, but you do have to be specific. So to ensure that you do these two things with your thesis, let me give you two formulas to use. The first is complicated and the second is simple. The first comes from John Irish and its main virtue is to set you up for an essay that earns the complexity point and it goes like this. Although X, because A and B, therefore Y. Where X is your counter argument, A and B represent specific historical evidence and Y is your argument. So going back to the 2022 A-Push prompt, here's an example of this formula in action. Although religious freedom was a perceived cause of population movement from 1607 to 1754, because the pilgrims enjoyed religious freedom
freedom in Holland before emigrating and because of the purely economic nature of Jamestown, people moved to colonial British America mainly for economic opportunities. So I made an argument here and I established my line of reasoning here. And I'm going to argue in this essay that religious freedom wasn't actually a significant cause and here are the two pieces of evidence I'm going to use. But a lot of students have trouble with that thesis formula because it is admittedly very complex. And if that formula is making y'all sweaty, then fear not, it is actually more than you need to earn the thesis point, so for you, just do this. Restate important parts of the prompt because A and B. Again, A and B represent specific historical evidence and so it would look like this. Population movement to colonial British colonies occurred mainly for economic reasons because of the pilgrims' religious freedom in Holland and the purely economic nature of Jamestown. <sighs> That smells like a point to me. Okay, now the second point of the rubric is for contextualization. For this, you can earn up to one point. Essentially, what they're asking you to do here is put the argument of your thesis in its larger historical context. And the rubric says you can do this before, during, or after the prompt. And, you know, you do you, boo, but I have never seen anyone successfully contextualize during or after the period. So my advice is to contextualize before the period you're writing about. I think that just makes more natural sense to students. So what you're going to do here is you write one paragraph, probably three to four sentences, that sets the stage for your argument. And I'll go back too far in time, only something like 50 to 100 years. And you know, there are no hard, fast rules on that, but in general, the closer you are to the time period that you're writing about, the better. And there are two things to mention here that will be the difference between a point and no point for contextualization. Number one, make sure you use specific historical evidence, and number two, make sure you demonstrate how that is relevant to your argument. So be specific, use vocabulary words here, don't just talk in generalities. But then go one step further and demonstrate how those events set the stage for your argument. Okay, now the next part of the rubric is the evidence section, and here you can earn up to two points. You can get one point for describing evidence related to the prompt, and you can get two points for arguing with evidence in relation to the prompt. Now, before I tell you the difference between describing and arguing, let me answer a potential question. Namely, how many pieces of evidence do you need to use in this essay? And that is a fine question. The rubric does not give you an upper limit, but it does give you a lower limit. The rubric specifically says, pieces of evidence, plural. So that tells me the bare minimum you have to use in either describing or arguing is two. Okay, now let me show you the difference between describing and arguing. To describe evidence that's relevant to the prompt, you just need to name it and define it. So if one of your pieces of evidence is imperialism, then I, you know, I just named it, and now I say, which is when one nation extends political control over another nation. Okay, so I just described that evidence. But hey, you're not here just to describe evidence, baby. You're here to get all the points in the section. So let me show you how to argue with evidence. And to set you up for this, let me suggest a paragraph structure that will form an argument. First, you need to write a topic sentence, and this is going to be one of your sub-arguments that you named in your thesis. As my friend Rachel Carr always says, your topic sentences need to steal from your thesis. So let's use this prompt from the 2022 AP Euro exam for an example. Evaluate the most significant similarity between the French Revolution of 1789 to 1799 and the revolutions of 1848. So let's say my thesis goes something like this. The most significant similarity between the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1848 was the call from the lower classes for liberal reforms and their ultimate failure after after the installation of a conservative ruler. So my first paragraph will have a topic sentence like this. Both the French Revolution and the revolutions of 1848 began with calls for liberal reforms from the lower class. Okay, that's a great topic sentence, but now I need to continue the paragraph with my evidence. I'll talk about the three estates in France and the marginalization of the third estate and the extravagant spending of Louis XIV, which created economic chaos in France. And then I'll talk about the reforms demanded by the third estate, and then I'll go on to talk about the revolutions of 1848 as well. And all the while, I'm gonna be demonstrating how these pieces of evidence prove my thesis, and that is important. All always tie your evidence back to your thesis. And then my second paragraph will deal with the installation of conservative rulers. I'll talk about Napoleon after the French Revolution, and he'll be a complex one because in many ways he upheld the revolutionary gains, and in other ways he did not. And I'll also talk about Napoleon III, and on and on. So that's how you structure a paragraph. Okay, now let's move on to the last section of the rubric, the analysis and reasoning section, in which you can earn up to two points. Now both of these points are awarded for the essay as a whole. The first point is awarded for your use of historical reasoning. So, you know, basically this point is awarded for doing what the prompt told you to do. If the prompt is a causation, question, then you'll get this point if you successfully wrote an essay demonstrating causation. The same with change or comparison. And that's about as complicated as it gets. Did you perform the historical thinking skill that they asked you to perform? And if you've structured your thesis and your paragraphs like I showed you, it will be very hard to miss this point. Now, the second point in this section is awarded for complexity, and you can get one point for this. And to be clear, this point is awarded, again, for the entire essay, not just part of it. Just like the DBQ, this one is difficult to earn. Something like 2% of the essays earn this point. And I made a whole dang video arguing why you shouldn't even be attempting this point unless you're consistently getting 
getting every other point except this one. So that's why I say aiming for a five is better. But if you do want to go for it, I'll let you consult the rubric for yourself to see all the options because there are many. But I think the simplest way to get the point is to weave a counter argument through the essay. And you've already set yourself up for this with the John Irish thesis. You've already acknowledged that there is another way to interpret the evidence that you're using, but you're not convinced that it is the best way to interpret the evidence. So if you want to earn this point, my advice would be to use specific evidence in each paragraph that could support your counter argument. You can't just write in generalities either about the counter argument. You've got to provide specific historical evidence. All right, now click here to see a template for how I would lay out an LEQ. I talk a lot more in this video about topic sentences and evidence, so if you need some help, Go crazy. And you can click right here for my APSA cram course, which will take you through every point on the rubric so you can see the examples of what will get the point and what will not, so you can feel confident you're writing for this course. And I'll catch you on the flip flop. I'm Lur out.